everybody to Hanley Library. I'm glad that you're here on a nice sunny afternoon and uh, sharing with us uh, today. I'm Pat uh, Ritchie. Uh, when, earlier today I gave a tour of the library with my library hat on. I'm a retired employee here for 23 years, been retired for four years. So earlier today I had my library hat on. Now I'm going to be Pat Turner Ritchie with my genealogy hat on. I grew up in Rockingham County uh, in an area called Brock's Gap. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I've been researching family history since I was eighth grade for an eighth grade history project. So far I've written about 13 books about people in, about my family members, and I've typed and or edited typed and edited books, about 40 books for other researchers, and also Harrisonburg Rockingham Historical Society, where I was uh, on the board for 15 years and uh, was president for a year. This is a picture of, of Brock's Gap. That's the actual gap in the North Mountain. And uh, if you're familiar with uh, uh, Fox Run, where I'm from, this is the Ruiton Park. Now, uh, probably not everybody here has heard of Fox Run or Brock's Gap. So here's a little orientation. Right now we're up in Winchester, the tip top of Virginia. Rockingham County is two counties south of here, the red area. And then this is a close up of Rockingham County. The county seats down here in Harrisonburg and the circled area is a geographic area known as Brock's Gap. Uh, it includes the communities of Fox Run, where I grew up, and Burton and Criders, where my husband Dan grew up. You can see there's not much going on in this uh, part of the county as far as towns or communities, uh, uh, even though, and it's even less now because this is an old map with some post offices that have gone out of existence. Most of the families in Brock's Gap have been there for 200, 250 years, generations. Uh, for instance, the Custer family, one of my families, has been there 250 years, and uh, there's been at least 10 or 11 generations of the Custer family lived within three miles of where the original settler uh, first had his house. Excuse me, let's go back here. When I was growing up, everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew everybody's business. <laughs> so when that's the case, and the families are all intertwined with cousins many different ways, so when that's the case, stories can uh, remain for a long time, longer than in the rest of the Shindle Valley. Yeah. Sometimes this laser pointer doesn't work the way I think it should. So let's get rid of the laser. Down. You only have technical difficulties during the presentation, not when you're practicing, right? Dan had his hip surgery. I'm going to cut out that laser pointer. There. When my dad, uh, husband Dan had hip surgery back in September, we moved our bedroom from the second floor down to the first floor living room so uh, he wouldn't have to navigate the steps while he was recovering. We laughed at each other and said, well, we're just going back to our Appalachian Mountain roots of having a living room bed. Uh, we visited people uh, in cabins and small houses in our neighborhoods where uh, the, the adults of the family did have their bedroom in the living area because that was nearest where the uh, wife worked and it was the warmest room in the house. If you've got a log cabin, that's where your stove is, the warmest room. That bed in the living room served as the honeymoon bed, nine months later the childbirth bed. It was a bed where people recovered from illness and later on, it became uh, the deathbed for a lot of folks. And I'm happy to say it was a recovery bed for my husband. Uh, 
uh, you can't see the book here, but my friend Peggy Shiflett wrote a book titled The Living Room Bed. Peggy grew up in, also in Fox Run, but a different part of Fox Run from where I grew up. Uh, her home was about 10 miles from my home, and different uh, families settled in her area from my area. Their families kept the traditions that had been passed around in the mountains longer than people in my community and probably in Dan's community too. She also grew up about 10, she's about 10 years older than I am, so her memories of the times and the culture is different from my memories too. Today we're going to share a lot of Peggy's stories, but I'm going to add in stories from my family and from other friends in the community. Here's a picture of Peggy's grandma in her living room. You see the bed there and her mom, her grandmother in her rocking chair. Also in the front uh, right hand corner is a split bottom uh, oak chair, which was common in a lot of our houses. Peggy's book about the living room bed is about courting, marriage, childbirth, uh, childbirth at home, curing diseases, and a lot more. Now, a mountain woman was expected to get married at a young age, move in with her in-laws, and uh, be trained by her mother-in-law as uh, in the proper ways of being a mountain wife. Peggy's brother married Hilda, a seventh grader in my elementary school class, and she quit school to learn to be a wife. Things were a little bit different by the time I came along, but I got married when I was 21, and I was just about the very last person in my elementary school class to get married. Now, I didn't have to move in with my in-laws to learn uh, how to be a wife. We moved away in, out of state, actually. But I did hear a little bit about this. I was telling my, uh, my neighbor, who's in her 80s, that, oh, I didn't know how to cook, and I was worried about cooking as a wife. And she said, oh, don't worry, honey. When you get married, you're going to have to learn to cook like your mother-in-law anyway. <laughs> And that sort of was true. I never did learn to cook uh, sweet potatoes quite the way Dan's mother cooked them, even though I've tried. Now, marriage was very important, especially in Peggy's time in her community, and there were some ways to help you determine who was going to be your mate. My friend Shirley Miller, who uh, spoke here a couple years, uh, a couple years ago at the library, um, she had some customs. She and her sisters would take turns hanging chicken uh, wishbones above the front door, and whoever was the next person to walk in the front door was going to be the new boyfriend. Um, Shirley didn't tell me if that worked out for her, but they had fun doing that. And then Shirley got married uh, before her two older brothers got married, and their mother teased the older brothers by this saying that Shirley had left them stomping in the hall trough. <laughs> After marriage, a mountain wife had usually had lots of children, and that was expected. There were several methods to predict how many children you were going to have. You could take the umbilical cord after the first child was born and count the number of lumps in the umbilical cord, and the number of lumps was how many children you were going to have. Another way was to make a fist, and on the pinky side, count the number of little lines between the big lines of your pinky, and that was the number of children. When I do that, I have two lines and I had two children, so that must work. Before the 1950s, most children in Brock's Gap were born at home, oftentimes with midwife instead of a doctor. One reason was the doctors lived pretty far away, um, and a lot of folks lived at ends of law on uh, dirt roads. And, um, so the dirt roads made travel impassable in muddy weather and also, uh, especially in the snowstorms. Also, the doctors cost money. And if you wanted to call the doctor to come to the house for a home birth, a lot of families didn't have telephones in Peggy's area. And some people in my area did not have phones either. So you, the father would have to travel to even call the doctor and then go pick up everybody. So that was another factor for staying home for the births. The doctor was expensive and uh, 
you probably didn't get prenatal care either. So we had some traditions of how to keep the, fam the, the newborn child healthy and guarantee a healthy birth. One of the traditions was stay away from tragic events. <laughs> now, uh, people believe that if a pregnant woman saw something horrible, it could mark the child with a birthmark or defects. The book has an instance of a, a girl in the Hopkins Gap area that was crippled from birth. Her legs were drawn up so tightly to her chest, and the tendons were so tight that she couldn't straighten out her legs. And that's how she lived the rest of her life. People said that that happened because her father, before she was born, liked to catch rabbits and cut the tendons in their legs and then laugh as they tried to hop around and run with, without the use of their legs. So that's, that's what happened to that girl. Now I was a little bit influenced about that. When my uh, daughter-in-law was pregnant with the first child, she and my son witnessed a horrible car wreck. And the first thought through my mind was, oh no, I hope the baby's not marked from that. You probably heard this one before. You should always satisfy the, woman, the pregnant woman's cravings. The book uh, gives an example of a woman uh, in the area that was craving red beets but was not able to get any to eat. And when her baby was born, it had a large red birthmark in the shape of a beet. You've probably heard of the strawberry birthmarks on children, and that was probably because the mother didn't get strawberries to eat during her pregnancy. There was another custom that I hadn't heard till I read Peggy's book, that when you're pregnant, don't reach real high and don't bend down real low because that would uh, make the umbilical cord go around the baby's neck and could strangle it. Childbirth in Appalachia could be dangerous not only to the mothers, but also to the babies. Peggy's grandmother had 18 children and lost five out of the 18. Her grandmother died uh, after the 18th child was born, well, it was four months old when she passed away. She was 39 years old. Uh, Peggy was from a typical large family with 20 aunts and uncles and 99 first cousins. And she knew all her cousins and she mentions a lot of them in her book. She's written several books and she mentions a lot of her cousins. Usually stillborn babies were buried without ceremony and without markers in the corner of the family's yard or close to the house. Uh, um, a house on Crybaby Lane in Fox Run is said to be haunted because of the stillborn babies who were buried in the yard. It was important for the first baby in the family to be a boy. Now I was the first of four girls before a little boy was born in my parents' family. And I did hear this quite often, that, oh, well, girls are all right, but it should have been a boy. Uh, and Peggy was the first in her family, and she also heard the same. One of my dad's store customers advised him to, if he wanted a boy, to hang his trousers on the right bedpost when he got into bed, and that would ensure a boy. That customer also uh, suggested that he could substitute for my family for my father too, but uh, that, that didn't happen. Peggy also wrote that another way to ensure a baby is to become pregnant under a full moon. The midwives who were delivering the babies usually learned just from observing and helping with births in the community. Uh, by, the late by the 1930s, though, Virginia wanted midwives to be certified and have a certain amount of training and to uh, and also sign birth certificates. This is my husband's great-grandmother, Frances Ritchie, and she delivered my father-in-law, all his siblings, and quite a few other people in the community and in, of Criders, Virginia. There are some customs for births that uh, midwives followed, and one lady in the audience said that she's a, a midwife, so we'll see if, you know, if you've done any of these customs. For instance, Peggy says that uh, Nettie, whose picture is here, would not allow the father to be in the living room when the baby was born because it was bad luck for the father to see his wife's private parts while the baby was being born. She also would, 
when she would come to the house for births, and Peggy said she loved to birth babies. That was the joy of her life. She would get so excited when she got to go to a birth. So she'd go to the laboring mother's house and check the mother first. Then she'd go out to the woodshed and bring in the ax and put the ax under the bed, and that would help cut the labor pains. Then after the baby was born, she would clean up the baby and carry it to the highest point of the house, whether that was the second floor of the house or just climb up a chair on the first floor of the house to ensure that the baby would go up in the world when it got older. Then she would pass the umbilical cord around the baby's head three times and saying the words in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. She'd throw the cord in the stove to burn it up and that would ensure good luck for the baby. And also keep away evil and witches. Now the mother in this, in this time period had to stay in bed for nine days. And the first three days, Nettie always cautioned, she should stay in bed all the time except to get up to use the chamber pot. The third, after the third day, she could get up and sit in the rocking chair to nurse the baby, but she wasn't supposed to do any other chores. Mary Kirkpatrick was another popular uh, midwife in Peggy's home area of Fox Run. I talked to Mary's granddaughter just a few weeks ago, and she said that Mary had a more scientific approach to, uh, to midwifing, and she didn't hold with all the customs that I've just been talking about. Consequently, some families would not call Mary for a birth. They wanted the old customs, and they would call Nettie instead of Mary. The midwives were often called granny women, and other people were grannies. I don't know if they were also midwives or if they just knew how to take care of babies and some cures for childhood diseases. Um, some of these cures I'm going to talk about may be new to you, so you might want to take some notes on these. When children were sick, the mothers would put the children in the living room bed so that they could watch out after them while they were in the kitchen doing the rest of their work. My mother, when we were sick, put us on the living room couch. We didn't break down the bed, but we had the living room couch. Now here's some of the uh, things that a granny would help you with if your child was sick. For congestion, put skunk fat on a warm flannel cloth and put it on the baby's chest, and that helps congestion. If, you've got, if your child's getting measles, drink hot lemonade with a teaspoon of moonshine. Whooping cough was still prevalent in the area uh, in the 1940s. So one cure for that was to put the child through the grain hopper in the grist mill, and that was supposed to help with their lungs. Another solution is pictured here, and this is an actual uh, uh, device that was shared by, a, I think uh, John Coughlin is about 70 years old, lives at Timberville. His mother would put codeine in a, a tin cup, like you see here, and then hang it above a kerosene lamp. The warmth from the lamp would, I guess, uh, heat the codeine and give some fumes that would help, help with congestion. Then there were teas made from animal, animal manure. Uh, a friend of mine in Winchester said that her grandmother, who was from our area, believed in these animal uh, manure teas, but her mother refused to give manure products to her children. Um, if you want the recipes, they're in Peggy's book, but here's, <laughs> here's some of them. Uh, cow manure tea cures blemishes like freckles. Sheep manure tea is good to make the measles rash pop out. Hog manure tea is good for the mumps. Now, uh, before we lowered the lights here, I noticed that most of everybody's my age or so, and we've probably had mumps. And uh, the cautionary thing for mumps in Peggy's area was don't uh, exert yourself very much because it can make the mumps go down on you. If the mumps went down on a girl, it would give very severe pain in her lower parts. And of course, this part is true. If mumps go down, go down on a man, it may uh, make him sterile. I have to add that my dad had mumps when uh, I think three of us were little, but he didn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. He had four children after that. Now, fretful children, 
uh, would be dosed up with paragoric. Paragoric is made from uh, opium, and you could still get it as prescription even in the 1980s. After uh, the program, I've got a bottle of it up here if you want to take a look at it. For stomach ache, turpentine with sugar. Uh, if you had warts on your hands or warts on your body, some snuff spit would cure those warts right away. My dad, when he was a boy, went to Cal Bear and uh, Cal spit some snuff spit on his daddy's hands and said, okay, now go away soon. And he probably said some special words too. We asked daddy, well, did it work? And he said, you don't see any warts, do you? Cures like this, like the wart cure, also involve saying some special words, usually words from the Bible. If you knew that those words, you could only pass that information on to somebody of the opposite sex. So if I knew the wart cure, I could teach it to my son, but not to my daughter. And if my husband knew it, he could teach it to the daughter, but not to our son. Otherwise, the power would be lost. Now, I gave a presentation sort of like this about 20 years ago at Broadway High School, where I graduated. And before I mentioned that part that I just said, uh, a girl in the audience said, yeah, uh, my cousin knows uh, how to cure warts, but she says she can't teach me. She's going to have to have her brother teach me how to do it. So that part of the saying was, was still in effect 20 years ago. Then there's acidity. I have a box up here of it. it. It's the same box pictured here, so come on up afterward and take a look at it. I bought my box of asafidity at Miller Turner's store in Cryers, where my husband grew up. Asafidity is really stinky stuff, and children would wear it in bags around their neck because the fumes of it were supposed to keep away uh, sinus infection and respiratory problems. And when I bought it from Miller Turner, he said, oh yeah, the old folks used to buy that, used to use it for everything. Cold, sinus trouble, we'll keep it away, witches, you name it. So uh, I also have some powdered acidity. So if you want to sprinkle some on yourself today, you'll be protected the rest of the day, I'm sure. As a child, my grandfather had to wear acidity around his neck in the wintertime, but he didn't make my mother do it when she was a little girl. My mother, Lena, uh, grew up in a different part of Hawks Run from Peggy, and a little bit different part than where I grew up. Although she had been uh, dosed with herbal teas for illnesses, like blackberry tea and cherry tea and things like that, she took us kids to the doctor for store-bought medicine when we, were, uh, when we were sick. She did not use traditional cures. But she surprised me about 25 years ago my uh, niece at that time, Celia, was not growing uh, as fast as she should have been, in spite of all the doctor's best efforts. My mother, of course, we were all worried about that, and she said, if big Minnie Ritchie was alive, I'd take Celia to be sized. Well, I'd never heard of sizing a child at that time, and I didn't know what she was talking about, so she had to explain it to me. Uh, a granny who knew this cure would take a string, and it was usually a special string, like one uh, spun by a young woman, and measure the child, maybe the height and maybe around the waist and the head and, and different ways, and then say special words, like I said earlier, probably words from the Bible, 